Hello, this is Dr. Chopsy, bringing you another episode of Beginner's Biology. In today's video, I will look at the structure of proteins, but before I do, I would just like to ask you to leave a like on the video if you find it useful, and to subscribe to the channel if you're new. Proteins, such as the ones shown here, are some of the most important molecules in our cells, and are responsible for almost all of their functions, as highlighted in the video linked in the card in the top right. If you have a look at a model of their structure, such as the example here, it may just look like an unorganised mess like this, or a blob if you're looking at the surface. However, they are a highly organised structure, with most parts of the protein being in a specific place for a specific reason. Before looking in detail at how proteins are structured in general, I want to go over the molecules that proteins are made from, which are called amino acids. These molecules revolve around a central carbon atom that has four different groups of atoms attached to it, the important ones being an amine group in blue, a carboxylic acid group in red, and a variable side chain group, presented here by the letter R, which is highlighted in green. There are 20 common side chain variations that are used throughout all forms of life in proteins. The final group is a hydrogen atom that doesn't affect the overall function of the molecule. These molecules are known as amino acids because of the amine and carboxylic acid groups that are conserved on all of these types of molecules. In proteins, Amino acids are joined by bonds between these groups to form a backbone similar to the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA, with the final product being a long chain that is known as a peptide. So now that we know what proteins are made of, there are four levels of structure that proteins can have. The first level, or primary structure, relates directly to the amino acid molecules that we were just looking at, and is the order that the different amino acids are linked in in the peptide chain. The secondary structure is the interactions between the amino acids in the chain forming small, stable structures throughout the peptide chain. The tertiary structure is the overall 3D shape of the finished peptide, with the quaternary structure being the interaction between multiple peptide chains to form one functional unit. Now that we have a basic overview of the four structure levels, let's have a look at them in more detail, starting with the primary structure. As mentioned, this level of structure is as simple as the order of the amino acids in the peptide chain. Think of it as having different coloured metal links in a chain. The order of amino acids in the protein, as well as the overall length of the chain, is determined by the DNA base pair order in the gene that the protein is based on. The DNA form of the gene goes through the processes of transcription and translation, which you can find out more about in the video linked here, to form the amino acid chain with the help of a ribosome. In the translation process, each set of three bases leads to the addition of one extra amino acid to the peptide chain. There are 20 commonly used amino acid molecules that our DNA can code for, and this is the same for almost every organism on the planet. The secondary structure of proteins are points at which the seemingly random shape of the peptide chain interacts with itself in different areas, kind of like a tangled piece of string. There are two very common forms of these structures. The first is the alpha helix, in which the side chains of neighbouring amino acids interact with each other and twist the peptide's backbone into a helical shape the variable side chains pointing to the outside of the helix. The second commonly known structure is the beta sheet. Here it is the backbone of several sections of the peptide that is responsible for producing a relatively flat formation, like a sheet, with the side chains pointing above and below the flat plane of the structure. Taking a look at the overall shape of the whole peptide chain, you will find the tertiary structure of the protein. This level incorporates all of the secondary structure formations, regions that link them together, as well as any potential extra molecules, known as cofactors, that the peptide may need to function. In our example of a tertiary structure here, with a subunit of the protein haemoglobin, you can see that there is a molecule of heme present, which is required for the protein's function of transporting oxygen. In many cases, this is the final functional form of the protein, and its correct formation is essential to its function. Many enzymes will not work if the overall structure is not correct, as this can lead to cofactors not being incorporated into the structure, or even preventing the molecules that they are meant to work on from being able to bind. Now, when talking about the haemoglobin example, you may have noticed that I mentioned a subunit of the protein. That is because haemoglobin is one of the examples of a protein that has a quaternary structure, where multiple tertiary structures associate with each other to form one fully functional protein. Hemoglobin has four individual peptide chains that make up the overall protein, as can be seen here, making it an ideal example as it has all four levels of structure. Hemoglobin has four individual peptide chains that make up the overall protein. Other proteins that use multiple peptide chains include antibodies, our first line of defence against invading organisms, 
which can have anywhere from 4 to 20 separate peptide chains or subunits making up one functional protein unit. So how are these structures held together? Well, the interactions between the amino acids that I mentioned before is a big part of how they're held together. They can range from physical links between the amino acids in the form of disulfide bonds between two sulfur-containing amino acids, such as cysteine shown here, to polar interactions, as used here in the beta sheet secondary structure, where small amounts of electronic charge on particular atoms attract each other in a similar way to a pair of magnets. There are even regions of structure that are held together by hydrophobicity, or the exclusion of water molecules, which is extremely important for proteins that interact or embed themselves in lipid environments, such as the cell membrane. So I've mentioned it a few times throughout this video, but the structure of proteins, and in particular, the amino acids, are critical for a protein's ability to do its job effectively. Enzymes and antibodies in particular need certain amino acids in the correct place, otherwise they may not be able to work at all. Changes seemingly as small as a single base pair DNA mutation can cause adverse effects to occur that can range from small change in activity or binding ability to causing the protein to become completely inactive or even cut short. In this example here, base sequence GAC leads to this amino acid here, aspartic acid, with a rather noticeable carboxylic acid group that could be important in the overall activity or structure of the protein that contains it. If a mutation occurs to change the middle base from adenine to its complementary base guanine, you can see that it would change this residue to a glycine amino acid residue that has no real side chain, with a hydrogen atom replacing the carboxylic acid group that does not have the same properties that the acidic side chain of aspartic acid possesses. A protein relying on this aspartic acid residue for either structure or function may not work properly if this mutation occurs, showing how a single change to even the primary structure of proteins can bring down their overall usefulness. And with that, I'll end this video. Thank you for watching. As always, please leave a like if you found this video useful or enjoyed it. And if you haven't already, I would really appreciate it if you click the subscribe button. You can find more of my videos here, but if not, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.